Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Analyst Angle. I'm Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at The Cube Research, and today I'm joined by my dear friend and frequent collaborator, Zias Caravalla, member of our Cube Collective Community of Analysts and um, independent analyst, all-around smart guy. Hello, Zias. Hey, Shelley. How are you? I'm great. Happy Monday. So today, we are going to talk about WebEx contact center and some of the new announcements coming out of WebEx about uh, AI powering contact, contact center and some of the challenges that we see ahead for WebEx as well. So with that, I'm gonna dive in a little bit. Um, we had a briefing with the WebEx team late last week and they shared updates across their suite of offerings. Um, the you know the updates focused on benefits for customers and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I'm gonna start by saying, I think the WebEx Contact Center solution is impressive. Um, they have a lot of features that I'm guessing a lot of people really don't know about. And I think that technically they've bet, built an incredibly competitive stack, but it's not a market leading one. And so I see that the challenge here is communicating to customers and prospects, you know, how the, about this differentiated experience that they've created and they continue to fine tune. Um, how do we how do we better communicate that to the market? And ZS, I know you and I've talked a little bit about this. What do you think? Yeah, well, I think it's first important to understand why Cisco is in this position where they have, from a technical perspective, what some people think is a market leading stack but they don't have the share, right? Yeah. Like um, if you think a decade ago, uh, Cisco was one of the leaders in contact center, center industry, all, albeit on-prem. Yeah. And I remember talking to previous management about how their cloud strategy was nowhere. And previous management thought that the private cloud offering that HCS or Broadsoft brought them was indeed cloud. Now, <clears throat> that's one of the challenges vendors have with analyst firms as some count things some way and some count things other ways. Yeah. And some of the analyst firms had Cisco be number one in cloud because they had the most private cloud seats, right? Now, while Cisco is relishing their position of private cloud and on-prem, along came, you know, Five9, TalkDesk and Contact, all those companies that sort of snuck up behind Zoom? them and started, taking, yeah. Yeah, Zoom, and started taking a lot of uh, CCAS share. Yeah. And then uh, I think it's, uh, you know, there's, what's that expression in business? The, you have to, uh, some people make things happen, some people watch things happen, and some people wonder what happened. And at the <laughs> end of the day, when I think Cisco wondered what happened, and along came the new leadership team, which included Java Khan and G2 and people like that, and they set yeah. out to actually build their WebEx contact center. And to Cisco's credit, they've actually built, like you said, um, a, a, a contact center stack that's as good as anyone's. Yeah, now, absolutely. Yeah, now the, the challenge they have though is that the CCAS industry is so crowded today, right? We have all the pure plays. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, TalkDesk and Nice and you know Genesis. And, Google Connect. Uh, yeah, Five9, yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, AWS, uh, A AWS Connect. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then there's all the UCAS vendors <laughs> that have also decided to get into contact center. And then you have to ask yourself, how does one insert itself into such a crowded landscape and gain some share? So there's the obvious, we can flip our base, right? But right. if Cisco's building us to flip the base, that's not winning the end game. And I, I think this is where a lot of the work they've done in the area of AI, if you believe that cloud was the last big transition in contact center, then AI will be the next big transition in contact center. But the challenge I see there, Shelley, is, Every when you go to the, all the competitive pages, it's not like they're not doing AI, and so it's trying to absolutely everybody's AI, focused on this. Yeah, trying to prove your AI is different and better than the other AI yeah. is tough. And I've used the analogy: it's like if you drive a car and it's got lane change alert in it. Like, can you really tell if Ford's or GM's is better? They both yeah. are better than what you had. They're not having it, and so in a lot of cases, having AI in my context is better than not having it. But it's tough to tell whether this AI is better than that AI. Yeah, absolutely. And that that differentiation is, I think, the biggest challenge here. Um, and while WebEx is a strong brand, I don't think it's a very well-known brand in contact center, right? And that's the other issue that they're they're uh, running into. I think is just that the the the, the WebEx brand is well-known collab for 
being secure, being resilient. You know, when you need it to work, all the big governments use it, but it does not have the same kind of, um, um, you know, the brand identity in contact center. Right. You know, one thing I think that is a really important part of WebEx's value prop is that Cisco is so well known for security and building on a foundation of security. And I think when you extrapolate that across any of their offerings, whether it's contact center or anything else, I think that remains something that's kind of important and something that other competitors have occasionally taken a knock about. Um, but I think that, you know, I wanted to touch a little bit about something that I think is really cool that Cisco is doing and some of some of these AI integrations um, designed, you know, of course, to up level the overall customer experience to to make the agent experience better, all of that sort of thing, you know, and some of these things that we'll be talking about were announced at uh, last October in late October at WebEx One. And I think now we're starting to see some of these roll out um, and some cool things, you know, they've got noise block. Well, doesn't everybody kind of has no, have noise block? And, you know, I think that being able to prove that our noise block is better than somebody else's is a matter of experience, right? Um, you know, they've got a large language model and they also have what is called a real-time media model. And these things together are, you know, powering what they hope are better customer experiences, clean audio, clear transcription, summarization, you know, all of this helping to lead to better informed decisions. And I think that, you know, when G2 was talking about WebEx's RMM, you know, and the fact that a large language model alone isn't enough. And of course, this is a, a video first company and, and we're talking about all things visual. And so, you know, this RMM using AI for audio and video in new and powerful ways, I think that's a differentiator. Um, and personally, you know, how many times have you, first of all, like I avoid having to call a contact center like the plague, but how many times have you had to call customer service and heard so much noise in the background that it's sometimes kind of hard to get your thoughts collected? Has that happened to you? Yeah. And I, <laughs> and I th think the, the noise box is interesting because yeah. everybody has it, yeah. but theirs actually is better because they have it's three really types. good. They have three types of noise block. They have the traditional one everybody has. Then they have one that's optimized for voices only. So if yep. you're in a, lo a loud space and there's four people talking, people can hear. Then there's one called optimized for, for my voice. So you could be in Starbucks with a bunch of people talking behind you and they'd only hear your voice. Now, from a contact center perspective, that's important because if you have an at-home agent, you can have your kids screaming in the background. And <laughs> people, I mean, that might be distracting for the agent, but you wouldn't know. And so that's that's a great example of a technology where they have the benefit, but, but because everybody markets noise block, their noise block doesn't really bubble to the surface. And the RMMs are interesting too, because you're right, LLMs have been looked at as a way to enhance text and speech. Um, right. But I think RMMs do a good job of video, but also uh, I think you can do, it helps with emotion detection. Yep. If we're gonna build smarter bots that are able to do empathy and things like that, or even alert an agent when to imply empathy. Uh, but again, you know, Cisco is the only one talking about RMM. So making that a marketable differentiator when you're a company of one, right, a market of yeah. one is a is a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And really, the end game here is, of course, better customer experiences, right? So I think all those things play nicely together. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that, um, you know, I know Cisco is doing is trying to help drive proactive comms as it relates to contact center things. So being able to get out in front of problems, anticipate situations, um, you know, and, and, and so being proactive is one thing and then offering up self-service options is another thing. And, you know, as you know, we are a, a, a community of do-it-yourselfers, right? I really don't want to talk to a person. <laughs> I really, I just want to be able to solve my problem. So being able to have functionality that allows me to self-serve, identify what the problem is I'm having and how to fix it, I think that's really cool. And then being able to pair that with human engagement that's added in, you know, when it's determined it's necessary. I think those are those are all good things. Those, are, again, are those um, unique to WebEx? Not necessarily. Um, but I think it's all good functionality and, and strategic makes sense. Yeah, um, and I'll be curious to see when the bots get so good 
that we prefer them over people, right? I've used the analogy that if you think of the rise of Open Table and yeah. Resi and things like that, there was a day where people thought, oh, there's no way I'm going to talk to, you know, book online where I can right. call the restaurant. <laughs> right? Now it's like, so much like, easier. Yeah, right. Now you don't have online reservation. You you might not. Um, you, you you might not use it. So, but I think this you is. Might, where, I think what you're saying. You might not like. It's like. I can't make a reservation online. I've got a call. Ugh, I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, that. I think that happens. I do that. But this is where I think um, it's not just Cisco. All the vendors, if they're going to uh, try and step above the noise of everyone else, I think this is where customer case studies, being able to tell the stories becomes important. And um, I haven't, you know, they, while they've got a pretty large base of customers, it'd be good to see those you know, become actualized in a public facing way. So people can understand that this, you know, this noise block is different than this noise block. Yeah. There are RMMs do this, that those can't. And, um, you know, I, I suppose they're, in fairness to Cisco, they're relatively new in, with WebEx Contact Center, right? So um, yeah. I suppose they're building those, but that's really going to be what uh, is going to, I think will determine whether they become a market leader or they remain kind of this niche vendor. Well, and I will say this, you know, you're in the same briefings that I am. And um, when you have the opportunity, I know that they are in the midst of customer betas right now with some of this functionality. And, um, you know, when when you see some of the brands that are in, that are involved in these beta tests. Um, I think that's, so, you know, we approach this and we know more than the average consumer, right? And we can see, wow, this is like a cadre of some really, you know, big companies across multiple industries and different use cases and things like that. So um, it'll be interesting when, you know, those customers come out of beta and when they're able to share customer stories, I think that, as you said, is going to be really impactful because, you know, I mean, it's human nature to go, oh, well, wait a minute. You know, I hadn't really thought about WebEx Contact Center, but they're using it and they're using it and they're using it. So the other I think thing for them is like, does the, does the UCCC integration, like where does it matter and where it doesn't? Because I've talked to some of their channel partners and as they've engaged up market, like big enterprises, it is different buyers. And yeah. so just because you're using WebEx for CC or UC doesn't mean you want to use it for CC. In fact, if you look at all the vendors that offer both, they yeah. tend to have success down market, right? Where you do have a single buyer, a smaller IT team, but as soon as you get up to where you have separate buyers, that UCCC integration doesn't matter as much. And yeah. um, should it matter? You know, probably. I, I think there is a certain level of efficiency by it. But it's it's interesting that when you just look at the data around the number of UC people, tools people use, they're still using Teams for this and Zoom for this and WebEx yeah. for this and Central for this, right? So it's not like even on the UC side, we've consolidated down to one. Right. It's unlikely that on a large enterprise, we're going to consolidate down to a single UC CC platform. And right. so that and from that degree, the tie into the WebEx suite doesn't provide as much of an advantage as it would down market. Right. No, absolutely. You know, one final thing I want to mention here uh, before we go on and just cover a few of the other things mentioned in last week's briefing was, and and I spent a lot of time in demos um, at WebEx One in October on this. And, you know, Cisco is really focused on agent well-being and they're really yeah. focused on uh, up-leveling supervisor effectiveness. So, you know, I cannot imagine I can imagine worse jobs than being a contact center agent. Okay, let's get real. But that's a hard job. You yeah. know, you are talking with, with people who are not having their best days. They're not calling because they're happy, right? And so agent burnout is a really, a, a real thing. And so the platform is built in such a way that it has agent well-being, you know, sort of a detection built into it. So you can see, you know, what kind of responses are happening and that sort of thing. And I think that helps supervisors be more proactive. Part of this solution functionality also includes automatic conversation summaries, um, recommended next actions, which makes a contact center agent's job, you know, much more, uh, much a bit less of a heavy lift, I guess. Um, and then it provides um, agent answers and suggested responses, I think, which are helpful. And then it also provides coaching highlights for supervisors. So 
you know, keeping the agent in a good place, but also providing the information and the tools to supervisors that you need to do a little teaching, to do a little mentoring and handholding, or to tell you that perhaps this person is in the wrong role. Yeah, I, I think, um, in fact, in this era of hybrid work, I think it's technology that's going to allow managers to manage better and agents to yeah. work better. If you think of the old way of managing a contact center, you would actually, the manager would physically walk around a bullpen and listening for calls that have gone awry or you know, yeah. frustrated, right? And no so pressure. Now, yeah, now the technology is going to do it for you because everyone's yeah. at home. And so that is an interesting um, you know, set of features that I don't think the industry at large talks enough about is the way yeah. you can change the management of the contact center. In fact, I think that's one of the interesting things to look at from a differentiator standpoint is can your product help me reduce agent churn? Because agent churn, like, let's face it, we can talk about all the things going on in the contact center, but agent churn is the real killer, right? You Absolutely. lose half your workforce every year. That's a lot of money and a lot of training. Yeah, absolutely. You know, another thing that I think is pretty cool, um, you know, those surveys that customers get, right, that, that you know, yeah. asking to rate an experience. Well, no surprise, 80% of those, this data comes from Cisco, by the way, from WebEx, 80% um, of surveys go unanswered. So they have some functionality here that they're calling automated CSAT scores. And so this is AI powered functionality that automatically kind of fills that data gap by assessing agent interactions to get a more complete picture. And then, and then again, that helps drive reskilling decisions or uh, you know other kind of decisions as it relates to that. These sentiment insights also help show you know when you know you can it's monitoring when a customer starts to get more upset and sees that escalation happening and so then you know this is where we need to bring in a supervisor or something like that so i think that's kind of some cool functionality it's interesting i talked to one company that um uh was using that feature from from one of the competitors and their CSET actually went down what? because in general people just answer one or five and their agents do a pretty good job of alerting the audience. Like it's a, it's like when you take an Uber, do you ever give anything less than five? No, I don't. Right. So what if I, only Uber in had, extreme extreme yeah. circumstances? What if yes. Uber had an AI enhanced <laughs> score where they used how fast the person drove, brake pressure, yeah, whether they were driving too slow, whether the totally car different. was too hot, whether the music was too loud. <laughs> Rarely would people get five, right? And so I think this it's I I think for the most part companies have no idea what their CSAT is. Yeah. And, uh, well, I, think I, think that you're, I think you make a really good point. This is a double-edged sword here yeah. um, because I will tell you this, when I do fill out a survey, um, I'm, I always remember that it was another human being you know, yeah. that I was dealing with. And I always also, am, and I think, you know, you're saying, yes, I think we may be the exceptions here rather than the rule. Part of it is, you know, because we're kind of immersed in this space, but, you know, I just know that I, I'm not going to, and for the most part, I will say this, for the most part, sometimes I'm frustrated by customer service interactions, but it's not usually the agent's fault. You know, it's an answer that I don't like. Or, yeah. or a resolution that I don't love, or so that makes me frustrated. But when I'm filling out those scores, um, those surveys, I never forget that that's another human being that I'm dealing with. And so I try not to throw them under the bus. So you make a really good point about how this could actually not be the best thing ever. Well, uh, maybe not for the agent, but certainly yeah. for the company to actually have a good understanding of what their CSET is, I think is very important. Because then they know where to fix and what not to fix. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So let's talk a little bit, shift a little bit, and talk a little bit about some of the broader WebEx announcements. Um, you know, obviously, you know, investing in audio and video intelligence are super important. And we've got, you know, um, a focus on delivering immersive experiences using AI, which is, you know, language intelligence, audio intelligence, video intelligence. Um, I love the, um, they, uh, they took us through a demo, a quick demo of the um, audio intelligence AI codec, which re reduces bandwidth without a reduction in meeting quality. And this is embedded in the WebEx app. And, you know, it, that may sound like a, you know, super nerdy thing, but the reality of it is when you can get 
great results with less bandwidth, everybody wins, you know? So what stood out to you with regard to these other announcements? Yeah, I really like that one, in fact. And yeah. um, I wasn't keen on the way um, they demoed it um, in that they showed the same call um, and the quality of them was the same, but they said this used 60K and this used Six. 6K, right? And what they should have done was run it over a 10K line and then one call would have been clear and the other one wouldn't have been. That's right? great. That would, have, yeah. that would have demonstrated a little bit better the difference. But I do think that's a very interesting feature um, that allows you to use WebEx in places. You think of third world countries, you know, up, you know, where you've yeah. only got satellite connectivity, things like that. Even the, you know, we, we toured the Johnson Space Center, right, where they did WebEx in space. Yeah. Um, now being able to do WebEx in places you can never do it before. I think that's um you know, that's their whole thing is around power and inclusive future. This, yeah. this actually does. It brings WebEx to people that couldn't use it before. Yeah. I you agree. need a lot of bandwidth typically, right? <laughs> you need a lot of bandwidth. Absolutely. Um, the other thing that we walked through a little bit was the WebEx AI assistant. And so this is, you know, designed to pull together all of AI tooling for users in, you know, a coherent way. Um and some of this is, you know, it can be used to detect when you step away from a meeting and giving you a placeholder there so that you can walk back. You know, I have that happen sometimes, you know, you know, I mean, um, I office from home, the doorbell rings in the middle of a briefing or a meeting, I've got to step away or something like that. So I like that, um, you know, I like that kind of placeholder that I can pick back up. I like the summaries and action items um, or a replay of meeting highlights. And But again, you know, those those things are not really all that unique. Um, but I think they're important. Well, I, think I think they're, they're table stakes. I think the catch up, I think the, the secret though is trying to make it as invisible as possible. Yeah. If the user actually has to go, what did I miss? They're not going to do it. If it says, here's what you missed, right? That's better. And I do like, I think, how Cisco's built the same um, uh, Gen AI agent across all their products. It's the same one they use with the security team and things. So they're yeah. bringing a little consistency to it, which is good, where historically that hasn't really been their forte. Yeah. Well, yeah. what else? I, I kind of try to hit on the things that caught my attention the most. Is there anything that you're thinking about that, that we haven't talked about? Um. No, I think you hit all the highlights there. And I think, you know, the big thing for them is now can they, they've done a great job of building these AI capabilities. Can they turn them into things that are a little more actionable so customers can understand and, and uh, you know, they can use it to kind of reinvigorate that group? Yeah. And I think it really goes back to where we started this conversation that they have what could well be, a, you know, a, a best in class stack here, but it is, uh, you know, it's all about communicating that, right? Some of it's marketing, right. some of it's working with your channel partners and enabling them and that sort of thing. So it'll be interesting to watch this roll out. Um, you know, I am and have been a, a longtime fan of Cisco and the WebEx platform. And I use it on a day-to-day -day basis for collab and video and all that sort of thing. And I think they're making great strides in Contact Center. Um, really looking forward to playing with the AI assistant. I think that, um, you know, I, I also I also should mention there are a couple of things like the the um, agent well-being with agent burnout detection is Q1 2024. The automatic con uh, conversation summaries and recommended next actions are Q3 2024. Um, the proprietary agent answers and suggested responses are coming in Q4. Coaching highlights for supervisors coming in Q4. So some of this stuff isn't, you know, in market right now, but it'll be interesting to see this roll out and um, people using it and getting feedback. And, and also laying like, the groundwork for where they're going. Enterprise Connects coming up, right? A couple yeah. months from now, I'm sure we're going to see more there. So yeah, um, looking forward it's to matter, it. It's a matter of continuing the momentum. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Zias. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure spending time with you. Thanks for hopping on today. And um, to our viewing and listening audience, we'll see you next time and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.